Hello, and welcome to our second special IBD Ready webinar for manufacturers dedicated to the topic of RUO products in the context of IBDR. My name is Erin Neckritz, and I am a customer success manager at Platomics, and I'm happy to guide you through our webinar today. I would first like to introduce the IBD Ready program in case you aren't familiar with it. IBD Ready is a free one year program consisting of a series of webinars designed to guide laboratories through the process of documenting their in house IBDs. The program was launched 10 months ago in May 2023 and will continue up until the next IVDR deadline for compliance on May 26, 2024. Anyone can join IVD Ready at any time through the link on our website. We are also holding special complimentary IVD Ready webinars like this one, covering topics of special interest for manufacturers. You can find recordings of all of our previous webinars on our website and YouTube channels as well as through the link posted here in the webinar chat. Now let me walk you through today's agenda and introduce our speakers. First on the agenda is a brief introduction to in-house devices and the current regulatory landscape from our chief regulatory officer and regulatory expert, Andreas Oberleitner. Next, I will introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Gabriele Staber, who will pre present a legal perspective on RUOs and IVDR. Then we will bridge back to Andreas, who will give an overview of the tools we're developing here at Platomics to address the needs of both laboratories and manufacturers. He will also give a demonstration of our PlatoX platform with a focus on the manufacturer portal. If you have any questions, you can enter them in the Q&A during the webinar. Due to our full agenda today, we might not be able to answer all of them during the webinar, but we will get back to you afterwards. Now let's start with an introduction from Andreas. Thank you very much. Good afternoon from my side. I hope you can hear me well. I will start sharing my screen because I prepared already some slides for the topic. Just give me a quick sign, Erin, if you can see my slides right now. Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, today, I would like to first uh, start with a very short introduction. And for that purpose, I would like to get back a little bit in time and uh, um, have a look into the historical background, uh, why the situation is as it is right now and where we stand right now. So first of all, we all know that uh, the old directive has been uh, found outdated at a certain time point. The uh, European Commission decided to update the IVD regulations. Um, there have been many points covered by these updates. So first of all, um, in the safety, but also in the performance requirements and many, many more. Um, the reason was because the old IVD directive was still from 1998, so really pretty old in the meantime, and therefore an update needed uh, to the state of the art. Um, the new regulation entered into force 2017, was fully applicable 2022, so we all know that story, I guess. Um, on the one hand, the European Commission recognizes that um, manufacturers need to place their products under cert certain circumstances onto the market. On the other hand, uh, the Commission also recognizes that not all needs can be covered by ma manufacturers alone, especially in the certain transition periods uh, where the new regulation entered into force and also became applicable, um, and also for certain uh, uh, applications like rare diseases and so on. Um, the union also recognizes uh, and sees that uh, it is not possible to cover all the needs only with devices potentially. So therefore, uh, in the preamble, uh, they also came up uh, with a kind of an exemption. And this exemption is the in-house exemption. So on the one hand, the um, commission allows laboratories also to create their, also, the, uh, their own in-house devices. On the other hand, uh, this also needs to be done only in a certain regulated environment. So the IVDR now also regulates in-house devices, uh, but sees this as an exemption to support uh, the availability of devices in general. Still, the Commission uh, wants to give a preferential, a preferential treatment to CE devices. Uh, it is clear that a product that has undergone the whole uh, conformity assessment uh, route under the uh, CE marking uh, routines, um, these devices are seen to be uh, compliant with the market requirements, and therefore we would say this is the typical way. 
Uh, the second way, the in-house case is also kind of a uh, conformity assessment, but under uh, slightly different uh, requirements, as we will see in the next slide. At the end, the commission over time also recognized that uh, obviously it did not work out well over time. So that leads to several adaptions. Never have been adaptions uh, regarding the requirements, but uh, adaptions in the course of time. So the timelines have been adapted uh, for both cases for CE mark devices, but also for IH IVDs for in house uh, IVDs. Um, and therefore, we now have uh, the following situation. Um, I think we also know that already pretty well in Article 5.5. The in-house devices uh, or the in-house manufactured devices, they need to fulfill uh, certain requirements. First of all, they need to fulfill um, the Annex 1 general safety and performance requirements. They should not be uh, transferred to other entities or institutions, uh, no manufacturing under industrial scale. I think that's also clear in the meantime. But with the next wave coming uh, up on us, which is... Uh, dated with uh, 26th of May, 2024, uh, a next pile of requirements will uh, enter the scene, uh, which uh, is on the one hand, focusing on requirements for the, for the quality management systems, for example, compliance with ISO 15109 is needed, but not only that, uh, laboratories or in-house uh, manufacturing uh, entities need also to fulfill um, requirements regarding the quality management system in general. So they need to implement a so-called suitable QMS. And this, of course, depends on what exactly the laboratory is doing while manufacturing in-house devices. Last but not least, uh, we also have uh, one requirement which lies a bit more in the future. Um, 2028 is the actual date, actually discussed to even postpone that for two and a half more years right now. But this is the justification for the usage of in-house devices, especially in cases when there is a comparable CE mark device on the market. And in between, we have this uh, situation where many laboratories are using uh, components which are not yet marked under IVDR, for example, but for example, have a status like research use only. And as we um, have a look again on the different scenarios which might lead to an in-house case, then we recognize that it is not only this scenario five here on the far right side, which means a laboratory literally designs and develops their own in-house devices, uh, like for example, creating their own pipeline, software pipeline for NGS, for example, but also the scenario three, um, which means that a laboratory is using research use only components, is in that course repurposing these components and also, not to forget, taking over the whole responsibility. And this is the case we would uh, like to um, have a look on today. So in general, we are talking typically uh, of four different levels, let's say, of devices. On the one hand, we have research use only devices. They are not covered by the IVDR, so um, excluded by the regulation itself. Um, of course, these devices need to have appropriate labeling, which means absolutely no clinical claims and no supportive materials uh, to, to, um, to, to direct to such type of a claim. Uh, still, such devices need to consider general product safety regulations, which also have changed a little bit in the past. Secondly, we have general laboratory usage devices. Um, we need to distinguish between the typical general laboratory usage devices not regulated by IVDR, but in some cases, these devices might also be regulated by um, by the IVDR in case when there is a clear in vitro diagnostic uh, relation and then they these kind of devices typically fall into class A of the IVDR. We also are talking about in-house IVDs. Uh, these are already IVDs which typically are also applied in routine diagnostics. So very close to CE marked IVDs, but as we know, um, they are only used and manufactured within one institution, the same institution, health institution or laboratory. Uh, 
And last but not least, I think uh, the very typical case is talking about CE IVDs. And from left to right, we know that uh, the level of scrutiny, the level of testing and oversight from the regulatory standpoint uh, increases uh, mm, uh, for each of the devices. So how does it match with uh, the typical application within a workflow? Um, we put it. We put on this slide here the example of, uh, of an NGS workflow, um, having specimen uh, doing a DNA extraction, library preparation, sequencing analysis, and leading to a report from left to right. This is the typical workflow. And within this workflow, we need to have a look now onto the products because the IVDR is always uh, considering or having an eye on the devices within these workflows. And for each of these steps, we have a multitude of different products available. And now, the user, in that case, maybe the laboratory, needs to think of, okay, what is the regulatory status for each of these products? So, for example, we have uh, something like this. Some of the devices might bear already a CE mark under IVDR, ideally, or maybe as being a general laboratory device uh, and falling under different types of regulations, but also research use-only components. So the laboratory now needs to think of, okay, is, is one of these REOs automatically my in-house IVD? But the laboratory could also consider to yeah, connect uh, some of them within its own intended purpose, which will be assigned by the laboratory then and uh, call this uh, combination then or system as being a device under the assessment and therefore as being the in-house IVDs. So this is more or less um, the connection on the one hand from the regulatory standpoint and where we are right now. And uh, it's also pretty clear what the problem is. Uh, we have different types of uh, regulated and unregulated products, all of them uh, shaping uh, a certain workflow, which then will be used by the laboratory as a diagnostic device at the end. And this diagnostic device, of course, is an in-house IVD and needs to fulfill the requirements from Article 5.5. With this uh, as being the introduction, I would like to hand back to Erin and also looking forward to the next talk. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. I would now like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Gabriela Staber. Gabriella is an attorney at law with a focus on the life sciences and healthcare sector. She is partner at an international full service law firm, has practiced law in both Austria and the United States, and regularly publishes articles about life science law in legal journals. To you, Gabriella. Thank you, Erin, for the introduction, and also thank you to uh, Platomics for the invitation to uh, talk a little bit about um, legal um, aspects surrounding research use only products. So uh, this is the uh, agenda uh, for the next 15 minutes. Um, so I'll briefly talk about the re legal framework, um, then about what makes a product a research use only product, what uh, you need to know as a manufacturer if you wanna uh, distribute research use only products, what you need to know as a lab, uh, if you want to integrate a REO product in a lab developed test. And then um, last but not least, and also very important, what are considerations in terms of liability and what are risks are there? And also a few practical tips how they can be managed. So the legal framework, um, well, um, there isn't much of a real framework for uh, research use only products. Um, the IVDR clearly states that it does not apply to research use only products. And also the MDCG guidelines um, states that REO products are not regulated by the MDR and the IVDR and are also not considered in-house house devices when they are used for research purposes only. So what does make a product a research use only product? Um, it's all about the intended purpose. A research use only product must have no intended medical purpose or objective. So it must be distributed for research use only purposes. Um, if a medical or diagnostic purpose is intended, uh, 
that two ways to repurpose a RUO product. One is that it can be um, used as a component of a CE IVD. In this case, the whole uh, system is uh, CE certified. And the other uh, alternative is to use uh, a research use only product as a component of an in-house IVD. And in this case, um, you can only use it in that uh, specific lab laboratory that establishes the test and cannot transfer the test to another laboratory. And what is important to know is that in both of these cases where the research use only product is repurposed, there's a shift of responsibility. So it's then not the manufacturer of the REO product that is responsible for the product, it will be the person who repurposes uh, the, the REO. Um, so um, what do you need to bear in mind as a manufacturer when you distribute a research use only uh, product? I already said it's all about the intended purpose. So you have to be very clear and very specific and very careful in your communications about uh, the research use only product. So it should not be marketed with any specific disease condition or diagnostic performance claims. Uh, if you refer to data, no data beyond non-medical application should be included. And any use recommendations should be consistent with the research use only label. So no medical use recommendations. And this does not only apply to the label and the instructions for use. It also applies to all promotional or sales mater materials that are in use and even to statements that you make, for example, in uh, communications uh, by sales representatives. Um, another question that comes up uh, is, so as a manufacturer, imagine you have been very careful about uh, your communications uh, of the intended purpose, but um, nevertheless, the REO product is uh, used for medical purposes. Is there any obligation to respond to that, to react, to correct, to not supply uh, to such uses anymore. Uh, I've looked here at the blue guides uh, on the implementation of EU product rules and that guide uh, gives some indications what, what the obligations are. So um, first of all, it addresses what market surveillance authorities are required to check. And they are uh, required to check the conformity of a product in accordance with its intended purpose. So that would be research use and not medical use. And uh, also they only uh, have to check uh, the conditions of use, which can be reasonable foreseen. Um, and uh, that is when such use could result from lawful and readily predictable human behavior. So, so Quite clearly, I think here we can see that the market surveillance authorities, um, if, if the product really is only market for research use only, will only expect that uh, use and will only check the conformity of a uh, product in accordance with that. And similarly for the manufacturer, uh, the manufacturer must also only consider the conditions of use which can be reasonably foreseen and must uh, and can expect that users will take into consideration the lawful conditions of use of his product. So, so again, also the manufacturer, I think, has no uh, obligation um, to uh, check or respond uh, to any um, use that is not uh, research use according uh, to these guidelines. And we'll talk about the liabilities and risks uh, that are associated with that uh, later on. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, now, um, let's talk also a little bit about lab developed tests. Um, we have already uh, heard quite a lot uh, from Andreas uh, about the, the requirements. Um, so, uh, just a short recap um, there are different ways a uh, uh, lab can uh, create a lab developed test. It can use uh, products that it has developed or refined itself. 
Um, it can use a CE IVD outside its intended purpose, or, and that's the, uh, um, the topic for us today, it can use uh, non-IVD devices in diagnostic uh, procedures, such as research use only products. And um, that's also a short recap of, of what we already heard. Um, there are several requirements that a lab developed test must comply with. And it's important to note that the lab has to ensure that the test uh, complies with these requirements. Uh, it's not the, if, if a research use only product is used, it's not the obligation of the manufacturer, it shifts to the lab here. And um, already now um, the lab has to comply with the or establish compliance with the general safety and performance requirements in Annex 1 to the IVDR. Um, additionally, already applicable is the requirement that the test cannot be transferred to another legal entity. Um, and there's also a prohibition uh, of distribution and production on industrial scale. So that is what is already applicable. And then there are a few additional requirements that will become applicable from 26th of May of this year. Um, so the lab must show uh, manufacture and use of the device under appropriate uh, quality management systems, uh, compliance with standard ISO 15189 or applicable national provisions, and it must also draw up a declaration, including uh, name and address um, of the manufacturers, detail to identify the device and uh, declaration that it meets the general safety and performance requirements. And uh, there are a couple other uh, uh, requirements also that Andreas has already mentioned that I've not put on this slide. I've just picked a few, I think, important ones. And then um, maybe uh, we can go uh, to the next. Um, Andreas has also mentioned that uh, from 26th of May, 2020, or if uh, according to the new proposal even later, uh, the lab will also have to establish that uh, the target patients groups uh, needs cannot be met by an equivalent device that is certified and available on the market. So there are a lot of requirements um, and it is, I want to emphasize that again, it is the lab that needs to establish regulatory compliance. The uh, responsibility shifts to the lab here from the manufacturer of the research use only product. And same uh, is true for documentation and traceability. So it's also the lab that needs to maintain a comprehensive documentation of the validation studies and performance assessment. Uh, conducted on the lab developed test using the REO product um, and must be able to, to um, show that um, in case of a regulatory inspection or audit. And now we come to the really uh, core legal topics, um, liability and risk. Um, so let's start with uh, the manufacturer first and we'll turn to the lab um, afterwards. So there are two uh, liability regimes that uh, can uh, potentially be applicable. There is product liability and fault liability. So for product liability, it's a strict liability regime, which means um, that you do not have to uh, demonstrate the fault of uh, the manufacturer uh, to establish liability. Instead, you just need to show that uh, the product was uh, defective when it was uh, distributed. And that will already trigger liability and it's also mandatory and cannot, cannot be um, excluded. So is there a risk uh, for the manufacturer under product liability? Uh, my clear conclusion is no. Um, because the manufacturer is only liable for the intended use of the product. So if the manufacturer has clearly um, communicated this is for research use only um, and the product is used uh, for medical purposes and that causes damage, it will not be uh, the um, manufacturer's uh, responsibility um, here. Um, the, only uh, case where um, the manufacturer of the REO product could be liable is if the product as such was 
defective, also if used just for research purposes. And that defect was causal for the occurrence of the damage. So just by, by way of an example, let's say uh, the defect, um, the product is used in, in, in the lab by an employee and causes an injury to the employee. Um, and and that, that injury would also have occurred if, if it would just have been used for research uh, use. Then um, this would be a case where the manufacturer could still be liable. But for any uses outside of the intended purpose, so if it's used for diagnostic purposes on a specific patient, the manufacturer would not be liable under product liability. Um, it's not look at fault liability. Um, generally, similar considerations would apply, um, but under fault liability, there's also a duty um, to observe the product after it has been put on the market. So the question arises here if uh, that triggers a responsibility of the manufacturer if a medical use comes uh, to its attention. And uh, I think the answer to this question lies uh, in, um, if you look at the IVDR and the blue guides um, and look at what the obligations are uh, of the manufacturer, um, we, we can, um, deduce from that, that the manufacturer can uh, does not have to expect unlawful use of the products. Um, plus, uh, the IVDR clearly allows use of a research use only product as a lab developed test under certain conditions. And that taken together, in my view, makes it quite clear that the manufacturer has no obligation um, to respond to, to medical use. Um, if that medical use comes comes to its attention, instead the liability shifts here to the lab, and the lab then has to ensure that the requirements under the IVDR for that are met. But nevertheless, um, I think it's a good idea to take uh, precautions. And um, in terms of precautions, uh, I think uh, contracts um, with the customer. Uh, can be, can be helpful uh, that clearly states that a product um, is intended only as a research use only product and that the manufacturer will not be liable for uh, any uh, use outside the purpose uh, that has two consequences that are beneficial for the manufacturer. First of all, uh, it underlines clearly the intention to distribute the product only for research use. Uh, and also you can uh, put, for example, an indemnification clause in that contract um, that gives the uh, manufacturer the, the right to take um, recourse uh, from the lab, for example, in case the manufacturer gets sued and then has costs for its defense. And this is sometimes not not fully reimbursed, even if the manufacturer is not found liable. So that can be a good idea to, um, to have some safety against uh, additional, these, these, these dam additional damages that can occur. Um, so let's look at the lab. So I already said there is a shift in responsibility and uh, that we can also um, see in, if you look at the implications for liability. So, um, the lab is, um, when lab uses the research uh, use only product uh, for its lab developed test, it becomes the manufacturer of the lab developed test and bears full responsibility for the final product. And that can be under product liability uh, and also under fault liability. So both is possible. I mean, have to look at whether the lab developed test is really a movable, tangible property or if it's rather a service, if it's only a service, we'll only be under the fault liability regime. If it's a product, then we'll have both product liability and fault liability available. And as I mentioned before, regress to the manufacturer is only possible if the research use only uh, device was defective itself. So that example I mentioned, if the employee, for example, uh, has a personal injury. So uh, in case, um, the lab or uh, in a special case, the manufacturer is found um, liable. What, what, what are the risks? Uh, what can happen? Well, a claim for damages can be quite high. Um, 
It may include medical costs, damages for pain and suffering, loss of earnings, and many other things. Um, and imagine this is something that, you know, it, it causes a, a lifelong disability, for example. Uh, this, this, this really came up. So these are very, very serious consequences, also financially speaking. Um, the exact amount will, or the exact calculation will, will be dependent on, on national law, but, but, but these are some general considerations that um, will apply in, in many countries. Um, other risks are, well, uh, there can be some enforcement by regulatory authorities. Um, uh, if, if uh, for example, uh, lab developed test does not fulfill the requirements, so they, they could order to terminate or sus suspend use of the lab developed test that will also depend, will be different from country to country, what could happen. There can be administrative fines um, and there can also be a violation of unfair competition law because the rules of the IVDR are not followed and that can trigger claims for an injunction, which would lead to the result that the test uh, cannot be used anymore, um, publication of judgment and also damages. And here competitors or consumer associations can, could sue. Um, so that's it for liability and risks. Um, and um, this is also the end of my uh, presentation. Um, there will be uh, time for questions at the end of the webinar, and I'm looking forward to answering these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriella, for that very informative introduction to the legal considerations of RUOs in relation to lab developed tests. I will now hand back to Andreas to deep dive into the regulatory aspects of RUOs. Yeah, hello again. Thank you, Gabriella, for these deep insights into the legal situation. I would like to pick that up directly and again share my screen to continue with my presentation uh, because I would like to talk a little bit about our product, the Plato X platform, and how the platform itself is reflected into this uh, legal environment. Um, first of all, I think it's really important to understand the Playtex platform as being a neutral agnostic platform. Uh, so the purpose of the Playtex platform is to facilitate the design and the documentation of laboratory workflows in general. And on the one hand, uh, we're talking about agnosticity uh, regarding types and clearances of components and products. So um, manufacturers can register their products on our platform and it's completely independent of which type we are talking about. So uh, you can um, register your reagents, kits, instruments, software products, etc. But we are also completely independent of the clearance of the products themselves. So um, on the one hand, you could uh, already register CE mark devices, CE IVDs, for example. But of course, the platform also allows you to register GLUs, which stands for general laboratory usage devices, um, research use only devices, REOs, of course, as well, but also other types of individual components, even consumables could be possible. Um, we are, of course, also agnostic regarding uh, any technologies. And uh, it's also important to understand that uh, in no case we will uh, emphasize one device or even one manufacturer over another or also favor one device or manufacturer or even one type of uh, clearance over another. On the other hand, our platform is also agnostic to the types and also the purposes of the workflows which are going to be documented by documented by the laboratories. At the moment, we are talking a lot about the in-house case, but of course you can also document different types of uh, workflows within our uh, system, which means that for example, um, you, if you want to document uh, your research workflows, uh, which you're using, for example, for different services or for research usage only, uh, and still uh, want to document it according to uh, certain um, frameworks like a good scientific or good documentation practice, this is also possible with the platform, um, which is still under development, this feature. So um, to sum it up, Playtex is a, a product data hub. Um, so we are not dealing with any products themselves. We are working with the information on products. So we aggregate the available component information 
of course, not introducing any new information on the products. We are only working with the information provided by the manufacturers. So the manufacturers still uh, stay completely in charge for the given information. Some information we are requesting is mandatory just uh, because um, the nature of our platform requires it to work uh, on this information. But still the manufacturers may completely decide uh, which information is provided in, at the end. And typically we are only talking about really uncritical, already publicly available information. Uh, for example, information which you typically would already provide uh, within data sheets or instructions for use to your um, customers. The information, of course, is not changed, altered, ranked, or some some in some way uh, otherwise used, except for the purpose of the platform. It's also important to mention that Plato-X is not a marketplace, so you cannot sell or buy products via our Plato, uh, Plato-X platform. Um, we are, as I already mentioned, only working on the information. And there is always this direct sales relation between the manufacturers and the laboratories, and this, of course, um, is outside of the platform. And we as Platomics are also not a distributor. Distributor is uh, also an IVDR regulated uh, role um, with certain obligations and, and certain requirements. So we are do not reselling products. We are not distributing products. We are only uh, providing information on products and processing them within the regulatory processes we already mentioned. Furthermore, uh, the whole product information is, of course, uh, protected accordingly, so it cannot be accessed by other players outside of the platform or uh, from one manufacturer to the other. Um, the system is implemented on a certified data center fulfilling the requirements of ISO 27001 on IT security. We also fulfill the latest security standards to regulate pen testing, penetration testing, and so on. And uh, we are not using uh, for that purpose any multinational providers, uh, cloud providers. We are only using local providers uh, placed within the European uh, Union. Um, yeah, quality lies within our DNA. Um, PlateX itself is developed under ISO 13485, which is uh, normally used as being a quality management standard uh, for medical devices themselves. But it's important for us to to even become ourselves part of the whole uh, game, which means that we ourselves are committed to fulfill uh, relevant requirements. And based on this, uh, we can um, state that the tool is fully validated and uh, we also support uh, user validation, which probably might be needed by manufacturers, for example, within their own uh, computerized systems validation approaches. Um, we um, The main goal is to ensure transparency, which means that it, uh, the usage of the platform should save time to collect all the product information and also to process this information, um, the data sheets collection, and also the data on technical performance, for example, depending on the device type again. And last but not least, uh, it's also important to mention that our content is completely contextualized. So we put uh, the information into certain contexts, uh, provided by the requirement or by the setup given by the user, but we do not rank or curate or any way um, in, in another way work on this data, of course. Um, providing explanatory information is one example of what we do um, to put the device in the context, which means that we um, also help the users, laboratories, um, by providing a glossary, for example, providing some examples, providing using tooltips, and that throughout the usage of the tool while creating the documentation. Okay, um, yeah, all of our users uh, are of course bound to, on the one hand, the, the legal contracts and also the legislation itself. So um, there are contracts in place, we have our terms of use uh, aligned with the regulatory law, and of course also the law itself um, is one important um, factor. And that means that all users uh, definitely commit to lawful usage um, on the one hand and also fulfill their respective responsibilities and competencies. What that means, uh, I will show um, in a couple of minutes. Um, so of course, um, one of the aspects here is that there is no legal vacuum. Um, so the situation is, is clarified. Uh, we have the individual contracts in place, of course, with all of the players and stakeholders 
the other contracts with uh, Platomix uh, itself, with with uh, in the platform um, mapped into the terms of use, for example. But on the other hand, as I already mentioned, and also Gabriela mentioned, it's very important to say that uh, there should always be contracts also in place between manufacturers and laboratories. This is not part of our platform, but um, definitely recommended uh, in a bilateral way because for both parties here, it's important to have uh, such a contract in place. So manufacturers need to ensure that they do not take over responsibility on the final product uh, if it's going to be repurposed in the case of REO, for example. On the other hand, uh, I'm pretty sure laboratories are highly interested in ensuring that they will receive always the same quality of products because with REO, the issue is that uh, there is no regulation, so therefore also no real requirements on quality aspects, and such things can only be ensured by setting up, uh, for example, quality insurance uh, assurance agreements, for example. Okay, let's have a look uh, on the most important case, the in-house IVD case uh, based on REOs. Um, so if a manufacturer sells REOs directly to the laboratories, we already heard about this situation from Gabriela. This is um, fine as long as the component is sold for research use only purposes and also claimed uh, um, accordingly and also advertised accordingly. But uh, it is absolutely not possible, of course, to um, do it beyond the given claim. So for any, for example, diagnostic purposes. As we also learned from Gabriela, it's important to consider that the internet purpose itself is not only a written sentence uh, like REO. So only claiming REO probably is not yet enough because everything, all the materials, advertising materials, instructions for use, and even uh, things that salespeople are saying to their customers could become part of the intended purpose. And this, of course, should not uh, be not in accordance with the original intended purpose of being researchers only. So what we face here is more something uh, like this. Manufacturers put REOs on the European market and laboratories, on the other hand, actively pick such the uh, components from the market. So it's the laboratory actively selecting an REO and also there is kind of a barrier. So, so, and also repurposing it. And by repurposing, we also know that the laboratory takes over the responsibility because it now has the obligation to make this component compliant as well. Compliant in that, in that case means uh, with article 5.5 of the IVDR. Now, the big problem is, okay, it's good to find such an REO, but how can I do that? Because the poor laboratory now uh, is in charge of making the compliant, uh, making the product compliant. And uh, for this purpose, uh, the laboratory really needs to know the component, uh, needs to know some properties of the component, or needs to do a, a thorough assessment uh, if the uh, general safety and performance requirements are even fulfilled by the REOs and furthermore, even filling gaps if that is not the case. So this is a, a situation which is not too easy to solve. And this is exactly where our platform Play2X comes into play because we are solving both of these aspects. On the one hand, the problem to get relevant information on these components, on the REO components, on the other hand, the issue of actively picking and repurposing the components and also committing to uh, regulatory requirements and making the shift of responsibility from the manufacturer to laboratories also clear and visible. So how does it work? On the left side, again, we have the manufacturers uh, with a pretty nice pool of different types of components here in this example. Some are REO, some are CE IVDs, and some are probably other types of CE, like instruments uh, following the low voltage directive, for example. And manufacturers can now on our platform register the information on these uh, products on our platform. So that means that information uh, on these uh, different components, C1 to C8, uh, can be stored on our product data hub, the device portal, uh, combined with the Workflow Studio in our platform. 
And it's also important to mention that the regulatory clearance on these products is always uh, visible and uh, emphasized uh, within these uh, documents or uh, relevant data sets. For REOs, but also for the others, uh, it's uh, important also to emphasize that it's always the manufacturer who takes care and uh, claims, takes care of the claim and also of the intended purpose of the devices. So this will not be touched at all. Um, this is exactly what the manufacturers do to delimit their own uh, claims and say, okay, everything outside of my claim will become an off-label use. On the other side, we have now the laboratory uh, which is interested in setting up in-house tests or um, diagnostic tests. And in our example, they are taking the component C2, which is an REO. And by using an REO, we already know that typically these tests will become an LDT, a laboratory-developed de test. So what would it mean? That means that on the one hand, um, Laboratories are allowed to do so because the MDCG guidance permits the usage of REOs under certain conditions, like the Article 5.5. On the other hand, um, by picking this component, which uh, is made available on our platform, automatically the usage of this information can be facilitated because it's going to be automatically processed by our system. So the laboratory does not only pick the component from the pool. Um, in the background, the whole information which is stored together with this component will automatically be processed and also populated into the resulting documents for the laboratories. This is an active choice and uh, clearly a decision done by the laboratory. So laboratory takes over with this step, the responsibility for this component as being a part of the in-house IVD device. And this is really crucial because um, this is the active step. Laboratories are taking over the responsibility, but uh, are also enabled to be to fulfill the responsibility by, on the one hand, getting information on the component, which can be reused for answering some of the questions, for example, in connection to the GSPRs. On the other hand, being enabled or being helped by creating the documentation they need uh, to have in place um, for any audits, for example, um, which is also facilitated by our platform. So to sum it up, um, we have different questions or challenges and how this is going to be solved in the tool. Um, yeah, on the one hand, the regulatory status or needs to be clearly stated and also the claim needs to be clear. Um, this is done by uh, relevant visualizations within our platform. The transfer of risk needs to be uh, clearly done. Um, on the one hand, this is, um, of course, uh, regulated via the terms of use. On the other hand, there um, are always clear disclaimers uh, throughout the platform. The repurposing as being an active step is uh, is according to a certain process is guided through the processes within the tool. So this is also clarified. The provision of information is given because we only provide information which is uh, potentially already publicly available, uh, but uh, we can provide it to the laboratories via the platform, which facilitates a lot the whole process. And last but not least, the responsibility for the final IHIVD, which is more or less re represents the final product um, with the diagnostic purpose in that case, then later on. This, of course, uh, is um, a product where the laboratory becomes the legal manufacturer, so to say. And um, our platform also provides the relevant declarations that need to be set up for the laboratory um, to take over this responsibility. Um, yeah, this is the process. I do not want to jump too much into the details, but um, it's clear that we have this uh, orange barrier here in the middle where the laboratories are taking over the responsibilities uh, guided through the platform and the whole documentation, the whole questionnaires, everything throughout the platform are adapted exactly to these cases. So to give a summary um, on the topics I uh, spoke about is on the one hand, um, manufacturer always define the intended purpose of its products themselves, depending on the, on the uh, clearance of the products. 
of course, uh, manufacturers need to um, provide uh, accurate and actual information. And for REOs, it's important to not have any claims beyond the intended purpose. This is also true for other types of clearances, of course, also for medical devices. There should not be any claim beyond the original intended purpose. And this is exactly reflected within the platform. We have the clear transfer of risk, the responsibility. Um, everything is used within a certain lawful usage. Even the in-house case is definitely legally permitted by Article 5.5 of the IVDR. And the repurposing is also mentioned in the MCG document. So this is supported. And um, we also learned already again from Gabriela that uh, the lawful usage has to be considered by the manufacturers, which is exactly re reflected as well by the platform. Last but not least, um, yeah, keep in mind, we are a neutral and quality driven platform. So um, trying to um, improve the availability of data and working on the data um, to improve uh, both sides or the, the life of all manufacturers and laboratories, so all stakeholders on the platform. Okay, um, this was my part, my theoretical part. And with that, I would like to quickly jump into the platform itself for a very short uh, demonstration. We only have a few minutes uh, left. But to, to show you how it looks like or how it works, I would uh, simply set up a, a component. I'm now in the uh, manufacturer portal. This, of course, is only a demo environment. So nothing you see here is a real component or a real um, um, manufacturer. I create a component. And typically, we have several tabs, one for general information, one for safety and use, one for detailed information, and then you can attach some documents to it. I will very quickly just create a demo component here. Um, for example, let me have a look. I can already repair that. If we, for example, call this, I just need to make a test here um, to avoid uh, repeating names and say this is a research use only. So the clearance is already given. Uh, I'm calling that a kit uh, and then I can also um, give a catalog number, which is mandatory, uh, just to identify the component properly. And I can now also give a version number to the device, assign a version number. And as an intended purpose, um, the case here is that every product should have an intended purpose, even research use only, but research use only itself is already an uh, in intended purpose statement, a very short one, but still valid one. So I will keep that one. And um, yeah, as a description, I prepared a small example here. And I will just copy paste it to have it filled. Now it's already filled. And uh, what uh, our questions are asking here in the next step, these are very general questions uh, based on safety and also usage aspects. And it's important to recognize that all of these questions are, of course, not um, not aiming for any diagnostic uh, aspects or medical or clinical aspects, but only on technical aspects. So, so these are uh, questions which you can answer for almost every product in that type. Um, so, for example, if it contains potentially dangerous substances or mixture of substances, this is a question which you um, should be able to answer for all of your uh, products, if applicable. Uh, and for the sake of time, I will not do it manually. I would simply apply a template. This is a functionality which uh, is uh, brand new within our system. So it saves a lot of time. If you have similar devices, you can, for example, use the, the templates which you created uh, on your own and just apply it and then it would pre-fill already all of the information. I need to save and continue still. And then we go to the next step, which, which is the detailed information and the same here. So um, this is detailed information on some of the parameters. Some questions are mandatory 
And uh, based on this, uh, you can also again create and save a template and later apply it again to similar products, which I will do here, just to save some more time. And as you can see, it's also already pre-filled. Good, and with that, um, you can also add a product image if you'd like, that would help your users to recognize the product uh, easier if you're a vision tip type of, of person. And you can also add some more documents. So for example, if you want to add some kind of safety data sheets or any more documents you would like to provide to your users, feel free to add them here and upload it in this section. Last but not least, the product is not yet visible to the users, uh, to the laboratories. Um, unless you publish it. Um, I will do that right now without any additional notes here, just for the demonstration. I now need to confirm that I have understood the terms and uh, the terms of use and also agree that my product or the information on this product will now be made visible. And now we see that this component is under my published list. Okay, and this component now is visible for the laboratories, I need to log out and log in again because I need to change the, the account here. I'm now logging in into a laboratory account and just open one of the demo workflows we created for that uh, purpose. Um, I've created uh, over the past few webinars. Everyone who followed the webinars is fully aware of the predecessing points here. Um, I will continue in working in the workflow studio. This is also something uh, which might be familiar to, to many of you already. And let's say we would like to add this component now in step three in the library preparation. This is the device I just created a few minutes ago with this number one, two, three, et cetera, the approach and library preparation test. I will add it to the workflow and voila, it's part of the workflow right now. So in the background, that means that the information the manufacturer provides on this component, by the way, it can also be reviewed by clicking it, uh, some of it at least, uh, the general information at least, um, this is the information I just entered a few minutes ago. No documents um, at the moment, um, but that can be also changed. And uh, in the background, the rest of the information of the safety and use, for example, will then be used uh, further on in the further processing. For example, when it comes to the general safety and performance requirements analysis where uh, some of this information automatically could be reused by the laboratory without uh, searching too much. Yeah, I think that's it for the presentation right now. Um, thank you very much. And I would like to hand over back to Erin. Thank you, Andreas. We have reached the end of our agenda. I hope our webinar has shed some light on considerations for RUO products in the context of IBDR and how Platomics approaches them. I would like to thank our speakers, Gabriella and Andreas, once again, as well as you for attending our webinar today. I'm happy to announce that our next IBD Ready webinar, an ounce of validation, will take place on Tuesday, March 12th. This webinar will outline IBDR requirements for validation and performance evaluation. You can already register using the link in the chat window or on our website. If you have any questions about Plato X for manufacturers or for laboratories, you can use these QR codes or the contact information below. A recording of today's webinar will be available on our website early next week, and we'll answer all the remaining questions collected in the chat individually. To make sure you don't miss any of our webinars, we invite you to register for our webinar series and our newsletter through the link on our website. Thank you for joining us today. Stay tuned and I wish you a nice rest of your day.